And a very good morning to you. Let's all stand together. Woo, we got a hot mic, don't we? Let's all stand together, grab that hymn book with me, turn to page number 476. Page number 476. As we stand together, we'll sing out about that joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. 476, sing out with me. 
I have found his grace is all complete. He supplies every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace within. What a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found that hope so bright and clear. Living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near. I can see his smiling face. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. All oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the joy no tongue can tell, how its waves of glory roam. It is like a great o'erflowing well, springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, the half has never yet been told. Amen. You know, of all the many blessings that come with a relationship with Christ, a joy unspeakable is one of my favorites. When we go through the storms of life and the difficulties, sometimes there's just an abiding joy that you feel like you can reach out and touch, but you also can't explain it. The Bible says it is a peace that passeth all understanding, but if you know it, you know it, and I hope you know it this morning. I hope you know Christ as Savior so you can have a joy unspeakable and full of glory. We're going to ask God to bless our service this morning, then we'll keep singing. And I'm going to ask Brother Mike Paget, would you please lift your voice and ask God to meet with us, please, sir? Amen. All right, as we continue singing page 196 now, page 196, if you are saved, I'll make you this promise. I'll meet you in the morning by the right riverside. What a place to be able to meet up together with. Amen. Page 196 as we sing out on, I'll meet you in the morning. <laughs> I will meet you in the morning by the bright riverside. When our sorrow has drifted away I'll be standing at the portals When the gates open wide At the close of life's long dreary day I'll meet you in the morning With a how do you do And we'll sit down sweet by and by and exchange the old cross for a crown there will be no disappointment and nobody shall die 
in the light of the sun go it down I'll meet you in the morning with a how do you do and we'll sit down by the river and with rapture all the acquaintance renewed you'll know smiles that I wear when I meet you in the morning in that city that is built for square. Before we sing that last verse, let's take a moment and greet with one another down here. as we make our way back to our seats. We'll sing on that last verse of 196. I'll meet you in the morning at the end of the way. Page 196. I will meet you in the morning 
at the end of the way on the street of that city of gold where we all can be together and be happy for a while the years and the ages shall roll how me How do you do? And we'll sit down by the river and with rapture all acquaintance renewed. You'll know me in the morning by the smiles that I wear when I meet you. In the morning, in that city that is built for square. Amen. It's a wonderful thing to have your ticket punched for heaven. Amen. Amen. I've always said I'm not looking to be on the next bus out of here, but whenever my bus leaves, I know where I'm going, and I praise God that I do. We're going to receive the offering this morning, and I pray that you're faithful to give as the Lord has blessed. And he has been good to us, so let's give back in accordance to that. I'm going to ask Brother Brian Fox if he'd please lift his voice and ask God to bless the offering, please, sir. Father, Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here today and just to hear your word and fellowship with your people, Lord. Yes. Yes. Amen. You may be seated. playing for us today, Miss Donna, and thank you, Brother Ryan, for leading us through singing. Choir practice tonight, uh, Brother Ryan is going to reach out to the choir about the plans for that. Doesn't know if he can do it yet, just some several moving parts there about it tonight. So uh, as far as choir, uh, Brother Ryan Leak will keep you all informed, uh, choir members, uh, about what's going on, okay? So just keep that in mind. A week from today is the men's chili cook-off. Now we need to take a moment to understand the severity of the subject of the men's chili cook-off. This ain't just another silly fellowship, okay? This is where titans of our age gather together and wage warfare in the area of chili and beans and meat. And praise God, it's going to be a wonderful time, and I hope you can be here next Sunday night after the evening service. Now, I believe we have six titans of the chili who have signed up, including their names. I love the names that they've picked. And so I think we have six, might have seven. But uh, let me tell you what's at stake here. The winner next Sunday night will be voted by the people. We used to have judges, and now I like to give the votes to the people. I'm a person of the people. So everyone who sticks around will get a ballot, and you will get to pick your favorite chili, and the winner will be announced. And uh, we have this chili pot trophy and all of its grandeur. And the date for 2024 is blank and I need a man to step up and claim the championship for 2024. Now, let me tell you the backstory. Brother Adam Barr has won two years in a row. He's flexing up there. You ought to see him. He's flexing. He has won two years in a row. And as a Colts fan, the, one of the reasons I hate the New England Patriots is because they were a dynasty. You say, what's a dynasty? A dynasty is a team that wins the championship over and over and over in a small period of time. This is what Brother Adam is threatening us with. So I need the men to step up and prevent us from a dynasty, but at the same time, we've never seen a three-peat. So I kind of want to see history as well. 
I'm just looking forward to some good food and some good fellowship next Sunday night, and I hope you can come. If you didn't sign up to cook chili, you are more than welcome to bring sides or desserts, things like that, but that is all next Sunday night after the evening service, so we will have a good time about that. That information is there in your bulletin. Now, teenagers, the Midwinter Youth Conference is coming up, and it's the first weekend in February, so it's, it's coming quick. So if you have any questions, you can see Brother Dylan Burkhart regarding that uh, as far as uh, arranging the overnight arrangements, the cost, the things like that, please talk to Brother Dylan. Uh, Faithway Baptist and Evansville do a great job hosting this, and they're needing some numbers to do their planning. So uh, teenagers kind of need you to decide if you're going, if you're not, or parents, if you do have some of those questions, you talk to Brother Dylan. Brother Dylan, don't you wave at him. He's up here on the front row today, which caught everybody off guard, but we're very happy about it. So you talk to Brother Dylan if uh, you have a question regarding the Midwinter Youth Conference, all righty? Now, for those who are not going to the Midwinter Youth conference on Saturday the 3rd. We will have a time of outreach at 930. We'll meet downstairs as we always do and get our maps and we'll go and we'll tell the community about a church that loves them, but more importantly about a savior that loves them. So that'll be February the 3rd at 930. Couples, we do have a sweetheart banquet coming up on February the 9th. That'll be at 6 p.m. It is a Friday night. The theme is fun in the sun. If you're going, I need you to sign up on the back table and the cost is $20 per couple. I need you to sign up and pay by the 4th, by February the 4th. Okay, we'll have games and we'll have prizes for the games and fellowship and food as well And I always try to bring a sermon that is really geared toward uh, the marriage toward couples to help them So that's the ninth. So I need you to write that down make note of that final announcement I'll give you I lied. I'll probably give you a few more Sunday February the 11th is soup bowl Sunday do this every year do several of these afternoon services throughout the year We'd like you to bring a soup or salad or chili if you'd like or sandwiches for the fellowship meal after the morning service We will have a 1 p.m. service to follow no evening service that night that is the 11th all right so make note of that and I did just want to bring your attention to the, some of the series we have going on the always abounding broadcast is back with new content every week I hope it's been a blessing to some of y'all on Wednesday nights we've been going verse by verse through the book of Proverbs uh, this especially this last Wednesday just some some hard-hitting truths from the Word of God and I made a statement that someone liked it's when I began to elaborate the sermon I said I tell you what I said I'll just let the Word of God tell you what's going on about it and then we just read it and we see what's going on and we're like man there is just some hard-hitting truths from the book of Proverbs that every Christian needs to hear. And so we haven't missed a one. We've been going through every verse looking at that and how we can apply it to our life that's Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And then Sunday nights at 6 p.m. We've been going through our family series, Pictures of a Christian Home. That's some hard-hitting truths as well, but all needed, all beneficial. Uh, I will also say this regarding Sunday school. The morning's message is about overcoming sin, getting victory over sin. But the Sunday school lesson in our, in our uh, adult class up here today was about what is sin, where did it come from, and why is it there, and what can it do, and things like that. So it's kind of a two-parter. So let me encourage you, if you are not uh, attending a Bible class at 930 on Sunday mornings, uh, I'd encourage you to come to mine. Brother Brenneman teaches a young adults class downstairs. There are other classes you can attend, but you are more than welcome to join us every Sunday at 930 in the auditorium for a very back-to-basics, fundamentals class kind of kind of thing that I believe is beneficial. I believe that's all the announcements. Just another reminder, choir, Brother Ryan Leak will be reaching out to you about plans for choir practice tonight. And uh, aside from that, I think we're good to go. So uh, we need to pray for Brother Ryan. Uh, he's uh, trying to fight off that, that junk that's going around so you can hear it in his voice. But I appreciate his warrior-like spirit, don't you? Don't you appreciate the Leak family? Amen. Amen. I sure do. We're blessed to have him. So Brother Ryan, won't you come and lead us in a couple more songs? When he started off with that chili, chili cook-off thing, Brother Randy, I was looking at you, of course, but um, how many of you men wanted to go all WrestleMania on that all of a sudden? I mean, like, brother! <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get there, right? So I don't have the voice for it today, so we'll have to just wait till next week. So it's going to be on. Well, let's all stand together. 382 now in that hymn book, 382. <laughs> As we sing out on standing on the promises, I'm so glad we have some promises of God that we can stand upon and know that he is going to hold them through, true. Amen. 382, standing on the promises. <clears throat> standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing.
standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God. Page 431, page 431 for our final song this morning. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses, we can just go and fellowship with God in just a sweet communion in a sweet place. Maybe it's a closet, maybe it's the garden, but you can go somewhere and just have sweet fellowship with him, and I'm so glad for that. 431, we'll sing out in the garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own.
has ever known. Good singing, church. If you're able to, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. We'll read our scripture, and I'll pray, and you'll be seated, and Miss Donna Blanchard will sing a special to us this morning. Romans chapter number 6, please. Romans chapter number 6. As I said, this is a bit of a continuation from our Sunday school lesson this morning, but it is also a continuation of some of the subjects we've looked about thus far in January. Uh, I've, uh, my desire is that all of us Christians here start January on the right foot, going the right way, and a lot of times that, uh, that involves dealing with some things that might hover over us as we go into a new year. Uh, the first uh, Sunday, we dealt with reflection, thinking about the last year, turning that into projection. How can we get better from where we were here? Last Sunday, we talked about forgiveness. We need to be forgiving people in order to move on. And today, we're going to look at overcoming sin. We're going to look at the sin that we all struggle with and how to get victory over it. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Are you there in Romans six eleven? All right, Romans chapter 6, verse number 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And we'll stop there, and I'd like to speak to you on the subject of overcoming sin. Overcoming sin. Father, would you please now meet with us in a mighty way. I beg that your power, your peace, and your presence be felt by everybody here, both in the auditorium and also tuning in via live stream. Father, I do pray that you deal with our hearts individually. We all have individual struggles and sins we are trying to navigate through, and we need your help. I do pray that you'd help us corporately as a body, as a church, as we long for your blessings and your power upon us as we begin a new year. Oh, Lord, that we would seek to ask you to cleanse us from any sin and iniquity that may plague us. But, Lord, I pray above all that you'd help us to be humble, help us to receive the word, help us to see where we need to improve ourselves, and help us to seek after you. Lord, desiring to be more like you. Father, I do pray that you'd please bless Miss Donna. She ministers to us through song. And then please, please, please bless the preaching to follow. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Sunday when the toils of life are over. And the saints are caught away. We will gather round the throne of Jesus for his coronation day. I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. I'm going to be there when the court of heaven rings with the happy song the angel chorus I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. All the universe will be assembled, numberless the gathering there. Angel hosts and all the ransomed army, glorious sight beyond compare. I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. I'm going to be there when the court of heaven rings, when the happy song the angel chorus sings. I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. Only those who put their faith in Jesus trust the work of Calvary. We will be, we'll behold that crowning day of heaven, day 
a final victory. I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. I'm going to be there when the court of heaven rings. With the happy song the angel chorus sings. I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. I'm going to be there when we crown him king of kings. I wouldn't want to miss that for the world. And yet think about what I just said. Some people will miss it for the world. Let's be careful not to miss that day, okay? Anyway, we're talking about sin this morning. Thank you, Miss Donna, for singing out. Romans 6, please, if you're not there. Romans chapter 6. As I did mention, we had a, a bit of a precursor, a prequel, if you will, to the message in Sunday school this morning. What is sin? Where did it come from? What's its nature? And then how to respond when you get caught up in it. And the message now is a continuation of that to a degree. But before we get to this morning's message, I will briefly review the lesson from our morning Bible class. We saw that sin is anything that is in violation of God's holy law. When we fall short of God's righteousness, when we rebel against Him, when we say no to His word, when we do anything that is not of faith, in fact, that is sin. 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. 1 John 3, 4, whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In Romans 14, 23, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We also learned how sin originated in our heart and our sinful nature is simply what is on the inside coming to the outside. And we talked about this to a degree. Jesus warned about this in Luke 6 and Mark 7. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That means uh, you're not as Mr. or Mrs. Perfect as you thought you were. Our hearts are deceitful and the Bible says desperately wicked. That's why Christians should not follow the advice where they say, well, just follow your heart. Where'd you hear that? I promise you it was not from the Word of God. Our heart leads us astray. Sin comes from our hearts, okay? So sin is nothing to take lightly. It is deceitful, as in it does look good, it looks wonderful, it looks pleasurable, and you can even probably reason yourself to commit it, but in reality, it is harmful and it is dangerous. <clears throat> sin is powerful. It is not easily overcome or defeated. Sin is destructive and has taken captive and hurt many, many people. Isaiah 128, and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. I can't help but think how many lives and testimonies and marriages and children and churches and businesses and livelihoods have been destroyed because there was a little sin that crept in. And rather than taking care of it, it took root and it obliterated everybody and everything that it touched. The bottom line, church, is we are all sinners every single day. One of us, <clears throat> Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, let's take our Bibles. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, which would be toward the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 1. We are all sinners, and what we're going to read is even the people who would say, well, I'm not. Well, there's even something here for you. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. 1 John First John chapter 1, verse 5. I'll give you just a few more seconds to get there. <clears throat> First John 1, beginning in verse 5. First John 1, 5. This then is the message which ye have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So the question, my friend, is not, are you a sinner? The question is... What are you going to do with that sin? And just in these verses, we see you can 
deceive yourself and say, well, it ain't a big deal, or I don't sin, or oh, I, I have my reasons, or whatever it is. Or you can just get clean with God and confess it and say, Lord, I, just, I need help with this. Confess it and forsake it, as we talked about in Sunday school. So, according to this passage in particular, and among others, we're all sinners, and anyone who would disagree with that truth sins by lying. So, by default, we're sunk. We're out of luck. We simply cannot attain or maintain the righteousness and the holiness of Almighty God. But I got some good news for you, church. Praise God. He loved us too much to leave us in that state. He loved us too much to leave us helpless and hopeless and hapless. He sent us Jesus, his only begotten son, to die in our place to pay the punishment for our sin. Jesus took your punishment and he took my punishment onto himself. And this was the acceptable atonement to God. The Bible says in 1 John 2.2 2 and 1 John 4.10, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I'm here to tell you that Jesus died in your place. He died in my place. So this sin that I'm struggling with, I don't have to let it tie me down and take me to hell. Rather, I can give it to Jesus, ask him to forgive me, and trust him that he paid the, pen, the, the, the penalty, he paid the sin debt that I could not pay, and then praise God, he will take care of my sin there. This sin that would sabotage me and send me to a devil's hell, I don't have to pay the punishment because guess what? Jesus did for me and he did for you. And we can accept this paid in full gift, gift as the atonement for our sins, by calling on Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to save our soul and take us to heaven when we die, in full faith believing that he will do what he said he would do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It means, are you going to heaven? Praise God, you got nothing to brag about. It wasn't you, it was him. And we're just thankful to be a part of it. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now help me out, church. Whosoever, does that mean everybody? Okay, just, just making sure. So it's not just a, a tribe or a race or an elect or the churchgoers. It's everybody, right? Jesus died for me and Jesus died for you and he died for everybody else in between. If you see him out today, Jesus died for them and maybe they need to know about it. Just saying. Through Jesus, our sins are forgiven and they're washed away. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together. Say it the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Psalm 103, 12, for as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. It is a blessing to know that my sins are forgiven because scripture promises that they are. However, if you haven't realized what I'm about to tell you already, as long as we live in this fleshly carnal body, we're going to be struggling with that sinful nature, aren't we? We're forgiven of it and praise God for it, and yet there's still a pull. There's still a desire, there's still a temptation to go back that way, to get back into that sin that Jesus saved us from. Praise God that he saved us from the penalty, and yet we're still struggling with the plague of it. We're still struggling with the, with the effects of it, if you will. The Bible calls it the old man nature. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, you, uh, let's go back to our text in Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read a little bit more of that chapter. Romans chapter 6. Give you a few seconds to get there, please. Romans chapter 6, and we started, I believe, in verse 11. We're going to start in verse number 1 right now. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be, what? Destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And then that ties right into the scripture we read a few moments ago, beginning in verse 11. This is why we have much scriptural instruction to purposely, that means on purpose, choose to live as we ought to live after salvation. Because if it was automatic, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. But after we got saved, God left us here for a purpose, didn't he? And he left us here with some instructions. And one of those instructions is to live as Jesus would have us to live now, rather than living after our own flesh. Rather than doing what we want to do and reasoning things the way we think they ought to go, you and I are supposed to be dead to sin and dead to that old man, dead to that old lifestyle, and living after the newness of life and living after Christ. Christian. Christian. We're saved. Born again. So therefore, we would say we are Christian or Christ-like. We're no longer like we were. We are now pursuing Jesus with our life. Every day we're trying to be just a little more like him. And I'm going to tell you, trying to retrain yourself to live holy and to live righteously and to think as Jesus would have you think and to live by the book, that's not going to come natural. Because naturally you're covered in this flesh. We were born into this world of sin, right? That's our natural state. Did any of you parents have to teach your children how to fight? or lie, or steal, or did it just kind of happen? You ever, you ever look at your kid and say, where did you learn that? It was natural. It just happens. And church, I'm here to tell you that it happens to us too. Now, as we get older, we learn how to disguise it a little better, but we still struggle, don't we? We still struggle with this sin nature, and we still struggle with doing the wrong thing when we know we ought to be doing the right thing. <clears throat> so... Yeah, we struggle with dying to self. We struggle overcoming sin. We, we struggle doing the right thing, even though we're saved. Praise Jesus, we're saved. Our spirit within us has been quickened. Uh, it's been regenerated. It's been born again. You can call it whatever you want to, but this old body, this old flesh, man, we're still struggling. We're still dealing with that old stuff we used to be into, that old mentality, that old man, that old nature, that old sin and those infirmities. Sometimes... They rear up and they trip us up and we struggle. Now we know that if we do mess up, as we learned about in Sunday school, we can quickly ask forgiveness and make things right. And we read this in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when a saved Christian sins, fellowship with his heavenly father can be disrupted. Grace can be limited. Chastening can come if we're not careful. And the devil can even use it to get a foothold and drive us further from God. This is why when we do mess up, we need to go to our Heavenly Father and say, Lord, I messed up. Rather than justify it, excuse it, or hope he forgets, why don't we just go to his, Lord, I messed up. Please forgive me and help me to do better, as we talked about at length during the Sunday school hour. It is so important to go to God immediately and make things right rather than let time pass. Don't let your heart grow hardened. Don't become callous to the Holy Spirit trying to help you get right with God. So, praise God, and when we do mess up, we can at least go to our Heavenly Father and make things right. He's promised us that. But maybe today there's a little something different in you. It's a bright and sunshiny day. Yeah, it's freezing cold, but it's beautiful outside. It really is. It's a good day to be alive, and it's a good day to decide that, you know what, I want 2024 to just be different. And maybe we go through the same old motions and the same old New Year's resolutions, and then we get to February, March, whenever, and all of a sudden we mess up and we fail, and we think, ah, we'll try again next year. Maybe you're tired of that. Maybe you're ready for something different. Maybe if you're like me, you're so glad that you can go to your Heavenly Father and make things right, 
But maybe you're tired of hurting them. Maybe you're tired of having to do that. Maybe, just maybe, there's something inside of you that says, you know what? I keep breaking his heart. I can go to him and ask forgiveness, and he promised he'll forgive me, and he makes it right, but when am I going to start feeling bad about that? Like a child who's more sorry that he got caught versus that he actually hurt or disobeyed his parents, when are you and I going to decide this is hurting him? This is breaking his heart. I'm hurting my heavenly Father and the Jesus who, not spilt, poured his blood out for me. The Bible in Hebrew says that when I willingly sin, it's like I'm trampling over the poured out blood of Christ. So yeah, I'm glad I got a safety net. I'm glad that I'm saved and I'm secured my salvation. I have assurance of salvation because it ain't based on me, it's based on him. I'm glad I can go to him and ask forgiveness anytime, but... Maybe, just maybe, you're, just, you're tired of that. You're tired of hurting him. You're tired of breaking his heart. Maybe you're tired of letting yourself down. Maybe you're tired of letting others around you down when you succumb to sins that you know you ought not be caught up in. You know it's wrong, and yet you keep falling back to it, and you say, I'm tired of the same old, same old. I've seen this episode, and I don't like the way it ends. Yes, praise God that he'll forgive me. That's a testament to how wonderful he is, but what does that say about me? I want to be the best Christian I can be in 2024. Not the same old, same old, struggling with the same old sin. I want to do something new. I want to get victory. For the first time in my life, I want to overcome the sin that's plaguing me. I want to overcome the besetting sin. I want victory over this thing. I don't just want to learn how to live with it. I want to conquer it. I want it nailed to the cross like it should have been. I want to get past it. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I think it is safe to say today, church, that we all struggle with something. We all struggle with sin. Now, the logistics, the details might differ, but we all struggle with it. We all have a besetting sin. We all have a, a hindrance in our life. We all have a, an Achilles heel, if you will. We, we got that, that, that sin. It's all bad, but there's that one, maybe two, maybe three, that seems to just have your number. And every time you think you get past it, there it is again. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's envy. Maybe it's hate. I don't know. Maybe it's laziness. Maybe it's theft. I don't know. But I know that you got one, and I know that it's besetting you, and I know that like a ball and chain, it's preventing you from being the best Christian you can be. And if you're like me in 2024, you're ready to cut the chain and move forward and conquer this thing. Not just learn to live with it, but overcome it and get victory over it. And I'm here to tell you that you're like, preacher, man, you're in my lap preaching. I do struggle. We all do. That's the point. We're all struggling, and maybe, just maybe, there's a select few who says, but I'm ready to stop struggling. I'm ready for the struggle to be over. I don't want to mess up no more, and I'm, I'm tired of the temptation that appeals to my flesh so much, and it, when it happens, it's like a, a monster just takes me over, and it's like I'm out of control. I've given way to something that's not me, and I don't even recognize myself, and it causes me to do what I shouldn't do and think as I shouldn't think, and it causes me to not do what I know I'm supposed to do, and so on and so forth. I'm tired of it, and I'm not just ready to just try to set it aside for a little bit, knowing that eventually it's going to creep back up. I'm ready to conquer it. I'm ready to kill it. I'm ready to have victory over this thing. This morning, I want to give you some things that you have been given already that perhaps, maybe, can finally give you victory over sin's power. You can overcome it. That sin you're struggling with, yeah, it can, it can be overcome. Now, maybe the devil's been sitting on your shoulder telling you, you'll never get better than this. How many of y'all have heard that before? You'll never get over that. Oh, I've got your number. And the Bible's clear, sin has its pleasure for a season, and let's be real, you like it too much to stop. I've got you. Maybe you're like, I'm ready to break free of that. First thing you need to know, 
victory comes through God's enablement. You can't do it yourself. Victory comes through God's enablement. You understand? I don't care how self-willed you are. I don't care how driven you are. I don't care how many experiences you've lived through. You're not going to conquer something as powerful as sin by yourself, and you need help. You say, well, preacher, can you help me? No. I can give you counsel. I can show you from Scripture. I can point you to the one who can, but my friend, I am flesh and blood like you, and I struggle like you do. I'm here to tell you, you cannot have victory through the church's enablement. You can't have victory through pastor's enablement. You can't have victory through Oprah's enablement or Dr. Phil's enablement or get that thing out of my way or anything else's enablement. You get victory through God's enablement and his word and that's all. And by the way, you know that thing's an inanimate object. It's not alive. Some of y'all were appalled. You were like, because I already know it's going to be a distraction. Go back to Romans 6. See, a lot of us, we think, well, I'll just put my mind to the, to the grindstone. What's that going to do? You've done that before, haven't you? Be real. Maybe it was last year. Maybe it was January 2023. You said, this is the year I get serious about it. Well, how'd that work? I love you today, church, but I'm here to tell you, you ain't going to get victory over this thing by yourself. You need God, and that's point number one. It comes through God's enablement. You need to understand that you can beat this thing, but you have to have him. It's not going to be by yourself. Realize that God has made it possible to overcome your sin. If he hadn't, there wouldn't be so much scripture that tells us we can. God enables the victory. It can happen. Romans 6, beginning in verse 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, as in removed and gone, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. We've overcome it. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in he that liveth, he liveth unto God. Look in verse 11. We read this before. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. As Jesus died and was buried, there went your sin nature. But as he resurrected, there's a newness, there's a power, there's a, a new man and a new creature. That's how we are supposed to live. Our sin has been nailed to the cross, buried in the tomb. It's gone. You and I have a newness and a new creature and a new man that we're supposed to live in. We're supposed to be as Jesus was, resurrected, new, moving forward, overcome the power of sin. That's how we're supposed to walk. Look in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, in verse 11, you see the word reckon. That's not the Tennessee reckon. To reckon, it means to consider, to conclude, to finalize. Maybe it is similar to the Tennessee reckon. But it means finalize, to conclude. I thought it through. This is the conclusion. We believe by faith that God has delivered us from the power of sin. And as we grow in this faith, as we grow, as we talked about this in belief and and maturity, we lean into this more and more. We read promises of God like this, and rather than say, well, that's nice, but that doesn't apply to me, that's a lie from Satan. The Word of God, of course, applies to you, and you ought to buy all the stock you can. You lean into that thing like it's a crutch. And you say, I am leaning on the promises of God and standing on the promises of God. And I'm using God's promises here to get me through this valley, this temptation, this sin that I know if I turn around, it's creeping over my shoulder. It's after to get me. Oh, I must keep going. I can't do it by myself. I got to have something to lean into. I need a source of strength, my friend. God is your source of strength. And his word is your source of strength. You grow and you learn this strength by feeding your faith, by leaning into the Word. Yeah, I know what the Bible says, but what does this guy say? What does that say? What does it? No, 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 stop that. What does the book say? And lean into it. Buy it. And make that your governing principle. 
we look for other sources of stuff, sure, if you want to, I'm not against doing research and act, asking counsel. That's not what this is. I'm simply saying that if the Word of God says it, that settles it, and you need to put more faith in the promises of God, not less, more. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, according to the Word of God, not some self-help guru, not the magazine on the doctor's table, according to the Word of God, it is possible to beat this sin. According to the Word of God. Victory is possible. If it was impossible, God would not have said these things. These verses would not exist in His Word. But apparently, through Jesus, anything can be done. Apparently, through Jesus, any sin can be conquered. Apparently, through the promises of God, I can overcome anything that would prevent me from being the best Christian I can possibly be. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And my friend, conquering your sin is a part of those all things. If you're too focused on yourself, your understanding, your feelings, your abilities, you're going to fail. And you're going to keep failing. Aren't you encouraged? Someone's going to take that five-second sound bite. Look at what Pastor Pearson said. You'll fail and you'll keep failing. But I'm telling you, if you keep trusting yourself, you will. If you keep thinking you can handle this, you're going to get humbled real quick. Your focus and your faith, I'm glad you have them, but they're in the wrong place. And it's setting you up for failure. That's why I have, through Sunday nights, we've looked at the Pictures of a Christian Home series. And it's been in your faith. It's been in my faith. Because we have to realize if we're going to succeed, it's not going to come from here. That's the world's thinking. It's got to be him and his enablement through me and through his word. I yield myself to God. It's the best way I know how. And say, Lord, I've got a bunch of tasks ahead of me that I don't know how to do. Please help me. Please use me. Please guide me and fill me with power and lead me the way I ought to go. You need to turn your eyes to Jesus. You need to put your faith in him and trust in his strength and trust in his enablement, not your own. Number two, victory comes through God's grace. Victory comes, number one, victory comes through God's enablement. Number two, victory comes through God's grace. Look in Romans 5. We'll just look in verse 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace is an act of divine influence, power, guidance, strength to our human heart. It is a superior power over sin. We just read that, and it's in several other verses throughout this scripture. Grace is a superior power over sin. The grace of God gives us the power and the ability to make those positive change in our lives as we need to make. Many of you could say, but for the grace of God, where would I be? Maybe you've got testimonies of your past, and you look back at where you used to be, and you look back at where God's got you now, and you'd say, it was the grace of God. How many of y'all have something similar to that? Oh, yeah, hands everywhere. It was the grace of God. You don't always know how to articulate it. You don't always know how to write it down on paper. You just know it was the grace of God that got me through that trial. It was the grace of God that, that kept us going forward. It was the grace of God that solved that problem. I look back and I was just along for the ride. I was just hanging on for dear life. It was the grace of God that got us through that hard time. Scripture just plainly teaches. You want His grace, and by the way, you need it. you got to humble yourself. You must humble yourself to receive His grace. God will not give grace to those of a prideful heart. We talked about that a bit on Wednesday night. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 and 6. For God resisteth the proud. God resists the proud. And giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Do not misplace or misuse or abuse the grace of God in your life. The grace of God that he gives you, it is not a license to sin. So you can say, I'm under grace. So you can live how you want to live. You know how much scripture condemns lascivious living? Twice we've read just this morning. Shall we sin because grace abounds? God forbid. Absolutely.
absolutely not, as we learned about in Sunday school, when Jesus, when he, uh, when he forgave the adulterous woman at the well. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now stop it. I've forgiven you. I'll, I'll restore you. Now stop it. Learn. Get better. Go forward. Victory comes through God's grace. Grace is the ability to overcome your sin, your storm, your temptation, whatever it may be. God's grace can see you through. God's grace can get you victory and uplifting where there previously was only defeat and only discouragement. You need to go to God and say, Lord, I am nothing without you. And I've got to have you. That's who he helps. The humble, not the prideful. Number three, victory comes through godly living. Godly living. Okay, see, now we're turning it a bit on us. Number one, you've got to have God's enablement. Number two, you've got to have God's grace. Number three, you've got to have some godly living about you. You're going to need to be self-disciplined. You're going to need to be temperate in order for sin to not gain an advantage of you, as Scripture talks about. You've got to keep yourself accountable. You've got to realize that Jesus is always there with you, even when there may be no one else around. You may think no one else knows about this. The Lord does. All of us. And if you can go home with that mentality that the Lord Jesus, his Holy Spirit's in my heart. My body is his temple. He dwells inside of me. He is with me everywhere I go. It keeps you accountable. We are commanded by God from the word of God to live holy and to live godly. Preacher, have you looked outside? Preacher, have you turned on the TV? Preacher, have you scrolled through Facebook? People are running from godly living. They're running from biblical living. You know what? And they will give an account to God. I'm talking to you. In, yes, in 2024, you were told to live as Christ would live. You say the Bible's no longer applicable. Hogwash. Poppycock. Baloney. Tomfoolery. Shenanigans and all those funny words. It is, it is more applicable now because of how bad it is out there, we need the light more now than we've ever needed it. We need to put some godly living back out there, church. At Schnook, at work, in your neighborhood, at school, wherever. We need to get some lights shining for Christ as they ought to be shining. You're needed in the battle. And this sin that you keep falling back into, it's dirty enough, your light. You're not shining like y'all. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. That means put forth effort to be a godly individual. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You have to have some established principles from the Word of God in your life. And these principles that you read from Scripture, principles that you read will lead to conviction. These convictions you will learn, they will lead to standards, and you will have a standard principled disciplined life. You'll have some rules about you. You'll have some regulations and guidelines to keep yourself out of trouble and living as you ought to live. That's how this thing works. When you look at someone's life and you say, oh, they're such a Christ-like individual. Do you think that happened overnight? No, it happened because year after year, day after day, they read scripture. They pulled truth. They applied those truths themselves. They became heartfelt convictions. And from those convictions derived standards and guidelines where they said, I don't want to break that, so therefore I'm going to live this way. And they did it consistently. And now what you see when you look at them is a godly man and a godly woman. It didn't happen overnight. It just happened when they decided, I'm just going to start doing the right thing. I'm just going to start living the way I ought to. I'm going to start talking the way I ought to. I'm going to start thinking the way I ought to. I'm just going to become the Christian I'm supposed to be. I'm telling you, it takes some self-discipline on your part. you got to look yourself in the mirror, and you have to say, I'm tired of this, and I'm ready to get victory. 
Let me give you just a few quick ways to exercise godliness and holiness in your life. You've got to control your mind. It starts here and it eventually manifests out this way. Stop dwelling on sinful things. Stop thinking about it. When Satan throws it in your mind, cast it out, as it talks about in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Casting down these wicked imaginations. And then park your brain on Philippians 4.8. There's a list of things in Philippians 4.8 that you are allowed to think about and that the Christian should. Write it down if you're taking notes, Philippians 4.8. As your heart and your mind go, so goes you. Another thing you ought to do if you want to exercise godliness in this life is you need to separate yourself from the world and from sin. Get away from it. Just, just get away from it. It's not worth it. Well, I've been, I've been doing this my whole life, and I, I, I've always liked doing this, and I, you know, how, just, just separate yourself. All the situations are unique. I understand that. Measures need to be taken. Steps, sure. But the end game is that you want to distance yourself from that thing that's hindering you, that besetting sin, whether it's a place or a person or a philosophy, whatever it is, you need to put that in your rearview mirror. Baby steps if you must, but you need to start getting away from that. You're becoming like Christ, not like the world. So head the right way. Stay away from those temptations that lead you to sin. Again, the people, the places, the, the websites, the TV shows, the music, whatever it is. Anything that tempts you to do the wrong thing should be avoided. Just, just get away from it. Don't even flirt with it. Stay away from it. And then... Every time you're confronted with a decision, be disciplined to pick the right thing. You know what I'm talking about. There'll come a time, a t an opportunity, a temptation where you basically choose the right thing or the wrong thing. The right thing to say or the wrong thing to say. The right place to go or the wrong place to go. The right thing to look at or the wrong thing to look at. You'll come to a, a fork in the road and you get to decide, and I'm telling you, to do right. Just purpose in your heart. I'm going to do the right thing. I, I'm, I'm tired of flirting with the wrong thing and thinking I'm not hurting anybody. I'm, I'm hurting myself. I'm hurting Christ. We can be better than this, Lord. So choose to do the right thing. Choose to do the right thing. Romans 12, 21. So just live right. Trust God. Do the right thing all the time. Sin will slowly start to dissipate from your life. You'll see. Control your mind. Separate yourself from the sinful, from the wrongdoing, from all that stuff. Just choose to do the right thing. And I'm going to tell you, one day you're going to wake up and realize, that's in the rearview mirror. It used to bother me every... I used to wake up and be tormented with this sin. And you're going to wake up one day and realize, that's way back there. Because every single day I started making the right decisions. And every single day I exercised myself to godliness and holiness. Every single day I maintained separation from the stuff that used to pull me down. Every single day I chose to follow Christ. And years later, look where I am. I'm not telling you you'll never ever struggle with it again. But I am telling you, you will get victory. Not because of me, not because of you, but because you started doing things His way. Lastly, last one, number four, victory comes through God's Word. Victory comes through God's Word. The Bible is a powerful weapon that arms you for the battles ahead. It is a shield from the bad things that are coming at you trying to trip you up. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What I'm telling you, Christian, is the Word of God, as you read it, it'll penetrate you to your inner man. It'll read your heart. It'll get to you. It'll cut to the quick, as they say. It pierces our heart. We can lie and deceive others. We can put on a nice face, and we can pretend to be something we're not, but we cannot lie or deceive God, and His Word will dice us up and show us where we need to get fixed. Just like a doctor would cut out an infection or a cancer, the Word of God is going to dissect where you need to fix. But you will not fix if you do not get in this Word and let this Word get in you. You can't do it without the Bible. Christian, can't do it. Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me wander from thy commandments. Excuse me, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. 
Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And by the way, not just reading it, but applying it. Activate the Bible in your life, dear Christian. Don't just let it sit as a decoration on your coffee table. You read that word, and you apply that word. You let it start changing you from the inside out. You want victory, don't you? This is a big part. Maybe the biggest part. You read it, let it read you. And don't just know about it. Activate it. Put it into play. This is what the Bible says, so therefore this is what we're going to do. And do it. Someone once said that of all of the devil's arsenal, of all of his best weapons, it is the Christian's ignorance of Scripture that is his favorite. Just think about that. If you don't know what the Bible says, what hope do you stand of fighting against Satan and his temptations in your life? When that besetting sin rears its ugly head, what hope do you have if your sword is always sheathed? What hope do you have if your lamp is always covered? You're fighting an unwinnable battle if you're trying to go up against the devil without the word. The more Bible you read, the less advantage sin will get over you. The more Bible you read, the less advantage sin will get over you. Let me close now. I don't know about you, but as for me, I want to be the best Christian I've ever been in 2024. I don't think that's prideful or arrogant. I don't want to backslide. Therefore, there's only one way. And that's up. Not that up. But you know what I mean. And if he if he raptures the church out of here, then we won't have to worry about this, right? We'll, we'll let Brother Broerman turn off the lights and lock the door and everything. <laughs> Nobody knows when Jesus is calling his church out of here. Nobody knows. My money is probably not going to be today. So therefore, you're going to have at least one opportunity out there to point someone to Jesus. When are you going to start? Where do we start? I want to be a better Christian this year than I was last year. But I'm telling you, it ain't going to happen if that old sin that I've been dragging around for years, for decades, for my whole life, is still holding on to my ankle like it's an accessory. I will not be the best Christian I can be if I'm still dragging that tempting, besetting sin with me. And it's time you cut it off. The Master needs you clean for his usage, dear Christian, and you're needed in the fight. Are you clean this morning? I don't mean did you shower. I mean, are you clean? Is your heart clean in the eyes of God? Or is sin tormenting you? And is it time to get rid of it? Let me encourage you. Take that first step. You ready to overcome that besetting sin? Take the first step, and the first step is going to God in prayer, telling Him how much you love Him and how much you need help. Lord, I love you. I'm tired of breaking your heart. And I'm ready to live as I ought to live. I'm ready to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm ready to start living for you, but I need your help. That's where you start, church. You start in prayer. Humble prayer. Getting it all out there. Confessing and forsaking. Get in His Word. Let him start to clean you from the inside out through his word. I'm telling you, you can have this victory. It can happen. It is not some insurmountable mountain. You can have victory over this sin. But it's only going to be by him, by his grace, and by his word. So what do you say? Father, would you please help us? Oh, how we need you. Lord Jesus, I need you. My home needs you. Father, I would be willing to say I am not the only one here this morning that struggles with a besetting, reoccurring sin. I hate to say, Lord, that it just seems like someday Satan has my number. But I also believe that's a lie he told me. I don't believe Satan can read my mind. I think he can only read my actions, and my actions point him to where I struggle. And Lord Jesus, we need your help to overcome this sin, this mentality, and the same old, old man, old nature actions that keep pointing Satan to where we struggle. And Father, I beg you, would you please point us in the right direction? 
Would you please help us to be more dedicated to you this year than we've ever been? Help us to be more students of the Bible than we've ever been. And Father, I beg victory for our church. I beg victory over the besetting sin that is haunting the individuals here this morning. Lord, the marriages and the children and the individuals and the homes and the businesses and all these things going on. Oh, there's so many problems. We could go on and on about all the issues we face. But Lord Jesus, the one thing we can say is, oh, how we need you. And oh, how we beg your presence at this hour. Please give us victory. Please get us on the right track, we beg. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to stand, I invite you to do that. No one moving around, no one talking. Miss Donna's.